Comenzamos el tema 2, herencia y reproducción. Nos habla Jesús Quidillo Poveda, que es el profesor del Colegio Nuestra Señora del Rosario de la asignatura del área de Biología y Geología. El tema 2 tiene por título Reproducción y herencia. Y el primer punto se titula Caracteres hereditarios y adquiridos. Todas las personas presentamos unas características comunes que nos definen como seres humanos. Sin embargo, no hay dos seres humanos exactamente iguales. Las diferencias que se observan entre las distintas personas, por ejemplo, en los rasgos de la cara u otros caracteres como el grupo sanguíneo o el color de la piel o el tipo de cabello, son consecuencia directa de la herencia. Otros caracteres, a pesar de ser hereditarios, pueden estar influidos por el ambiente. Así, la altura de un individuo está determinado por la herencia, pero puede variar dependiendo de la alimentación recibida durante su infancia. Algunos caracteres que seguimos, como las cicatrices, los adquirimos a lo largo de nuestra vida. No obstante, gran parte de los caracteres que observamos en los individuos son hereditarios. Es decir, se transmiten de generación en generación mediante el proceso de reproducción. Estos caracteres van a ir apareciendo durante el desarrollo y el crecimiento de un individuo y se manifiestan a lo largo de su vida. Los caracteres que son el resultado exclusivamente de la acción del ambiente no se transmiten a los, a los hijos y se denominan caracteres adquiridos. A veces es difícil determinar si la variación de un carácter es hereditaria o tiene un origen ambiental. Muchos de los caracteres heredados se manifiestan de una manera diferente según las condiciones ambientales. Sin embargo, las variaciones en los caracteres provocadas por el ambiente se caracterizan por no ser heredables, es decir, por no transmitirse a la descendencia. Para que la variación de un carácter sea heredable, ha de afectar al material hereditario, es decir, a la información que los padres transmiten a los hijos. Imagine coming into the world with a person so like yourself that for a time you don't understand mirrors. As a child, when I looked in the mirror, I'd say, that's my sister. And my mother would say, no, that's your reflection. It's hardly surprising because you both come from the same egg. You have precisely the same genes. And you're literally clones better known as identical twins. And yet, it's not uncommon for a twin like Anna Marie to get diagnosed with cancer, while the other, like Clotilde, doesn't. But how can two people so alike be so unalike? Well, these mice may hold a clue. Their DNA is as identical as Anna Marie and Clotilde's, despite the differences in their color and size. The human who studies them is Duke University's Randy Jurdel. So Randy, I see here you have skinny mice and fat mice. What have you done in this lab? Well, these animals are actually genetically identical. The fat ones and the skinny ones? That's correct. This gets even more mysterious when you realize that these identical mice both have a particular gene called agouti. But in the yellow mouse, it stays on all the time, causing obesity. So what accounts for the thin mouse? A tiny chemical tag of carbon and hydrogen called a methyl group has affixed to the agouti gene, shutting it down. Living creatures possess millions of tags like these. Some, like methyl groups, attach to genes directly, inhibiting their function. Other types grab the proteins, called histones, around which genes coil, and tighten or loosen them to control gene expression. Distinct methylation and histone patterns exist in every cell, constituting a sort of second genome, the epigenome. Epigenetics literally translates into just meaning above the genome. 
So if you would think, for example, of the genome as being like a computer, the hardware of, the, of, of a computer, the epigenome would be like the software that tells the computer when to work, how to work, and how much. In fact, it's the epigenome that tells our cells what sort of cells they should be. Skin, hair, heart. You see, all these cells have the same genes, but their epigenomes silence the unneeded ones to make cells different from one another. Epigenetic instructions pass on as cells divide, but they're not necessarily permanent. Researchers think they can change. And that brings us to the reason why we're showing you twins. In 2005, they participated in a groundbreaking study in Madrid. Its aim? To show just how identical epigenetically they are or aren't. Our genes are just part of the story. Something has to regulate these genes. And part of the explanation is epigenetics. Estella wanted to see if the twins' epigenomes might account for their differences. To find out, he and his team collected cells from 40 pairs of identical twins, age 3 to 74. Then began the laborious process of dissolving the cells until all that was left were wispy strands of DNA, the master molecule that contains our genes. Next, researchers amplified fragments of the DNA until the genes themselves became detectable. Those that had been turned off epigenetically appear as dark pink bands on the gel. Now, the genes from a pair of twins are cut out and overlapped. The results are far from subtle, especially when you compare the epigenomes of two sets of twins that differ in age. Here on the left is the overlapped DNA of six-year-old Javier and Carlos. The yellow indicates where their gene expression is identical. On the right is the DNA of 66-year-old Anna Marie and Clotilde. In contrast to the younger twins, hardly any yellow shines through. Their epigenomes have changed dramatically. The study suggests that as twins age, epigenetic differences accumulate, especially when their lifestyles differ. One of the main findings of our research is that epigenomes can change in function of what we eat, of what we smoke, of what we drink. And this is one of the key uh, differences between epigenetics and genetics.